free to me. <laughs> I just showed up. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Stacey Abrams, for, for having this conversation with me. Just some housekeeping things. We're gonna, we're I'm gonna be asking her questions, but if you're out there either online or in this room and wanna ask Stacey Abrams questions, please go to slido.com. Um, and the event code is South by Southwest, and the room is Salon H, and you can submit your questions to her. We're gonna be taking those questions, or, well, she's gonna be taking those questions, um, so please do that. So, to start. During your TED Talk, which of course I've watched in full several times to get ready for this because it was a pretty good TED Talk. Thank you. Um, you said recently you had to tackle one critical question after your race and your bid for governor. You said, how do I get beyond the bitterness and the sadness and watching an inordinate amount of television as I eat ice cream? <laughs> how did you do that? You were assuming I did. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I... I'm still angry, I'm still very bitter, I'm still sad, but I only let myself revel in it for a couple of days, only about eight days. Uh, I also had acute viral pharyngitis, which made not standing up much easier. I'm not joking. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, when you're, when you're that overwhelmed by sadness, it's easy to stay there, unless, and, and I didn't have, I wasn't clinically depressed, I was just, you know, morally depressed. And I was angry because of the situation that there was no closure. Usually in an election, people just tell you, we don't like you, and you know it, and you move on with your life. And in this case, I don't know if they didn't like me because we didn't get a fair election. And so, <laughs> and so without the closure, part of my responsibility was to sort of wade through the emotions and you know, my parents told us a long time ago, they said, sometimes you don't get over things, you just get through it. And for me, I got through it. I put the ice cream away. I had not turned off the TV though. And I got back to work. And so we launched uh, Fair Fight, which is focusing on electoral reform. This week we're launching Fair Count, which focuses on the census and making sure all of those underrepresented communities actually have a voice in the 2020 census process and in redistricting in 2021. And then I'm working on a third project, so I actually have a day job. Um, and so for me, the convert, and then I'm also thinking about what I'm gonna run for next. Um, <laughs> We're gonna get to that later. We'll, we'll get, <laughs> We're but, definitely gonna get to that. But the, 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 <laughs> the point is, I, I, you, I think it's disingenuous to say that you get over being bitter, that you get over being angry, that you get over being sad. Uh, I'm watching in real time this person who has this job and I just watched him this week encourage a six-week abortion, an abortion ban bill, saying that women cannot control their bodies six weeks into pregnancy. The danger this poses to, to women and their families is extraordinary. I'm watching him steal elections in real time by putting $150 million into the pockets of his friends. I'm gonna be angry a while, uh, but what I'm not gonna do is be still, and that's the most important thing. Mm. Just now you talked about not getting a fair election. You also said that you're watching him steal elections. Um, in the book that you wrote that's coming out soon, you said, I refuse to play my scripted part um, because the game had been rigged. You didn't give a, a, a traditional concession speech. How is that different, do you think, than? President Trump in 2016 as a candidate saying that the election was rigged. So, so there are two different pieces here. What's happened over the last 20 years, we've conflated two very different ideas. Voter fraud is a myth. And that's what Trump was referring to. This notion that people were going out and voting more than once were manufacturing votes. We have a hard enough time getting 50% of the people to do anything. People are not getting in line three times to vote. That's not what happens. Often when what's called voter fraud is actually people making a mistake because voting rules differ not only from state to state, but sometimes county to county. We do not have a uniform democratic process in the United States. And so what is often called voter fraud is really voter confusion. Very few people actually commit voter fraud. You have election fraud, which is what we saw happen in North Carolina, and that's when folks manufacture processes in order to manipulate someone else's choice. But what is most egregious and most insidious and most pervasive is voter suppression, 
Voter suppression is when you create obstacles to registration, to ballot access, and to, then to ballot counting, or what I refer to as Georgia, Georgia, and Florida. <laughs> and voter suppression is real. So when he argued that his, that his election was rigged, he was arguing that, f that a false number of people cast votes. And we know that it's mythology. We know he lied. Let's be clear. He was lying about what was happening. We have real-time records of what happened with voter suppression, not only in Georgia, but nationwide. And so the difference is, I'm right and he's wrong. To follow on that, the executive director of the Voting Rights Advocacy Group, Common Cause Georgia, Sarah Henderson, who, uh, who used to work for you, she said it's hard and difficult to prove whether or not you would have won had things gone differently. Um, she said, we have no way of knowing, no paper trail. So the question still is, do you think the language, using the word rigged, using the word steal, do you think it's dangerous going into 2020? I, I don't, because we can actually back it up. We turned in 200 affidavits of people who detailed in sometimes heartbreaking uh, granularity what happened to them. We know that as Secretary of State, Brian Kemp purged 1.4 million voters, including 600,000 right before he threw his hat into the ring to become governor. We know that 53,000 people were prohibited from registering to vote because of a system called exact match that a federal judge said was racially discriminatory and unconstitutional. And so in response, he asked the state legislature to pass it into state law. We, and 90% of the people captured by that system were people of color. We know that 30,000 provisional ballots had to be cast because of inadequate machines, including machines that didn't have power cords because who knew electric machines needed power? We know that African Americans face the longest wait time to vote in the United States, up to four hours in some places. We know that there was one county that rejected 10% of the absentee ballots requested, and those that happens to be the, state, the county with the largest naturalized citizen population based on a signature match. My signature doesn't match from Kroger to CVS, <laughs> and they were using signatures to deny people the right to vote. So, we can provide in granular and deep detail at least 55,000 examples, but we know at least one and a half million people had their votes either interfered with, purged, or somehow manipulated. And whether it's incompetence or malfeasance, or he was just following the law, we can't tell. So I can't prove that I would have won, but I know we don't know because of how he behaved. You just laid out a specific set of things that happened in your election. Do you think if this happens nationwide in 2020, if there's something like that happening in Texas, in Florida, in Pennsylvania, should the Democratic nominee concede? I, do, I don't believe concession means what it used to mean. Or just accept the results of the election. I don't think we need to accept the results of anything until we know what the results are. And, 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 and I want to be clear. So is that a yes or no? Like if, if basically, if, if what happens to you happens nationally and we, we see uh, whoever runs for, whoever wins the Democratic nominee, if they say, actually, I can prove that there's a number of votes in every state that, that, and the, and the, the same thing that you just described happens in multiple states, should they concede? I do not think we should concede an election until we know the results of an election. And that was part of the challenge in my election. And, and I'm not being evasive. I, I really do think this is a nuanced issue, so you have to have a nuanced response. We know that on November 6th, not all votes were counted, and therefore, my campaign, instead of allowing, it, we, we actually put, we pushed every news station to not call the election because we knew that all votes hadn't been counted. We then launched television ads, radio ads, digital ads, and we were able to demonstrate that 30 more thousand votes in a 10-day period had, been mis, had not been counted. We had three lawsuits that were completely found in our favor. One, we got half of a result. It was insufficient for me to prove empirically that I could win, which is why I did not, which is why I acknowledge that Brian Kemp numerically won the election. But I refuse to concede because concession means that the process was proper, that the result was true and right, and I cannot say that. But I think what we need to learn from that is that Georgia is not alone, that Georgia is one of 50 states, but that we know voter suppression happens nationwide. And so I think what's incumbent upon any candidate in 2020 is that we do not call the election until every vote is counted. Mm -hmm. And that means we sometimes have to take time. 11 p.m. is not a magic hour. Mm -hmm. We may not know who the President of the United States is in time for evening news. And if we don't, we can wait. 
And we can wait until the next day, especially because in some states like Georgia, there is no paper trail. Mm. Because in some states, they have a long wait time. California, apparently, it takes 30 to 70 days mm. to get a result to an election. But those are okay things. We can wait for democracy to be right. Gotcha. That is our responsibility. Um, you recently had a really big job, and that was to respond to Donald Trump's State of the Union. Um, most people did not envy you, and most people, I, I, I think, were saying, okay, let's see what Stacey Abrams do does. Um, what do you feel you accomplished during your State of the Union response? So, in my book, Lead from the Outside, and I know we'll talk about it a little later, but I, I wanna, in the book, I talk about failure, and how you not only learn from your failure, but from others. Marco Rubio sent me like a really nice tweet <laughs> uh, saying, by the way, <laughs> hydrate before you give the speech. Um, <laughs> Joe Kennedy said, do not use chapstick too much. Uh, and you know, Kathleen Sebelia said, she was like, practice smiling. Um, so, you know, it's an extraordinary moment to be able to speak for Americans. Uh, because the response is more than just one politician giving an answer to the president. You're speaking on behalf of people who otherwise do not believe their voices will be heard in the body politic. And so my responsibility was to make sure people knew why I was doing it, talk about the issues that we are concerned about, but then also paint a picture of where we can go. And it's nerve-wracking and terrifying. Uh, I was thirsty the whole day. Um, <laughs> but it was also the most profound opportunity I've seen uh, to speak for others and to say collectively as Americans that we can get through the next two years. We may not ever undo what has been done and the harm that has been caused, but we are a stronger nation than sometimes we give ourselves credit for. An opportunity to redeem what has been done wrong remains before us and we can, we can focus on that. In um, in your book, you talk a lot about voting rights, you talk a lot about voter suppression, you also have a new organization, Fair Fight Georgia, um, which is focusing on registering voters and the role of people of color. Um, what role do you think that organization will play in 2020, specifically in the Democratic primary and in the general election? So, so the preface talks about voter suppression, the book itself is a, a broader conversation about leadership, but the role of Fair Fight, which is the organization Fair Fight Action, Georgia is ground zero for voter suppression. We had a Secretary of State who for 10 years took advantage of almost every single version of voter suppression you can imagine. And he yoked it all together into a seamless system that gets you no matter how you enter the space if he doesn't think you should be voting. Fair Fight is designed to fight back, to push for electoral integrity, uh, for voter activism and voter engagement. But we also wanna be a platform and a model for other states because this isn't endemic to Georgia. And so what we've been doing is not only working to fight, uh, we've filed litigation which hopefully will have federal, it's a federal lawsuit so we'll have national implications. We have a legislative initiative and we are doing advocacy work. So the intention is to fight in Georgia but to create a platform that lets other people and other groups fight in their hometowns. Um, I want to ask you one thing about your book, but before I do that, I, there's one thing that I think everyone in this room probably is thinking about, which is 2020 and the role that Democrats will play. In poll after poll, if you're a Democrat out there, the number one thing you're telling po pollsters is, we need someone who will beat Donald Trump. Um, what's your advice for how to beat Donald Trump, and is bluntness the answer, or is ignoring his insult insults altogether? I think beating Donald Trump is the wrong mission. When you're focused on your enemy, then you are ignoring your allies. And, and we, more importantly, have to recognize that Donald Trump is symptomatic of the problem. He is not the problem. Um, Donald Trump would be a neutered president if we had a Senate that actually did its job. If we, for the last two years, had a, a legislature that was engaged in holding our leaders accountable, we don't have that. And so any presidential campaign that focuses solely on trying to out-Trump Trump is destined for failure. Our responsibility is to articulate a vision for America where we talk about who we are, what we want, and how we serve our people. 
That is what a president is supposed to do. And I don't want to elect the best bully. I want us to elect the best person, someone who has a vision, has values that I hold to be true, and someone who's demonstrated a willingness to align that vision and those values and actually accomplish things. That's what we need to be doing. And any presidential candidate who is not talking about voter suppression, who is not talking about poverty, who is not talking about engaging every single community, if you hear only one community discussed, then you need to be really worried, but you also need to push the candidate because we cannot have a president for a single population again. That's what we have right now. And that is insufficient. We are a diverse nation and we need a president who sees and values every single American and anyone who lives on our shores. But I guess to the, the, the question still in some ways is that people still want someone who's electable. Um, there are gonna be a lot of Democrats running who have some of the same values, who believe some of the same things. You hear them talking about voter suppression, you hear them talking about different communities, but what's the style that you think should happen? And I guess looking at your State of the Union, you were, you were, you were pretty blunt in your State of the Union. Um, you didn't try to out Trump Trump, but there are people who are saying, I don't, I'm not gonna talk about Trump, I don't, wanna, I don't even wanna get into insulting him. Then there are people who say, we need to call him out and say what, he, what, what we think he is. Again, I, I think the, the problem I have with that narrative is that we are focusing on Trump. Trump is not the point. I think I said his name maybe twice in my State of the Union response, mm -hmm. maybe three times. The, the point was what is happening with our nation and what's our vision for our country. You can respond to someone's behavior without adopting their behavior to inform your response. So it would be wrong to adopt his behavior is what you're saying? Yes, he okay. is a bully. He is, he, he's like the embodiment, sorry. <laughs> he is the embodiment of what we're well, often taught. I am. <laughs> I mean, he is someone who learned his political style from insult the comic dog. Mm -hmm. That is inappropriate mm -hmm. for someone who stands in the highest echelons of our nation. But, but here's the other point. point. The presidency is a job. We need someone who's willing to do the job. And that means talking about what the job is. It means actively engaging in it. And this is, this is a job interview. I don't want to hire someone who in their job interview tries to reflect what they saw in deaf, you know, comedy jam. Like, we need someone who's running for office because they understand the gravity of what's at stake, but electability is a false narrative if it's based on what happened in 16, because we did not lose in 2016. Democrats didn't lose in 2016 simply because of the genius of Trump. Mm. We lost because we ignored communities who needed to be heard. 70,000 people decided that election. And in every state where those 70,000 people resided, you had communities that had they been engaged in a deeper way, had they understood that their values not only mattered, but that they mattered. Because we, we don't, and this is true about campaigns from the presidency on down. We had campaigns being run in all of these states that didn't go to certain communities. If you'd driven a truck through Flint and talked about how you can get access to water if you go and cast a vote, more people would have turned out. And I'm not saying Flint, Michigan was alone the solution, but Democrats did not do, we didn't do our job of actually engaging and turning out every community. One thing that we learned from my campaign, you can center communities of color, you can talk to and about the marginalized, and you can win their votes by treating them with the same values and same respect that we often accord to what are seen as perennial voters but you have to put the investment in. We spent a lot of money in those places and it worked. We tripled Latino turnout. We tripled Asian Pacific Islander turnout. We increased youth participation rates by 139%. We increased black turnout by 40% and we increased white participation in the Democratic Party by 2%, the largest increase in the last 20 years. And so these are things that can be replicated, but we need candidates who aren't so focused on Trump that they forget the people we need and who need them to, to speak to them. That, what, the point you're making actually dovetails into my next question, which is the, the, a question about the term identity politics. Um, you write and have talked about this. Um, what do you make of that term? And then what do you make of the idea that some people think Democrats run the risk of talking about race too much? You can't miss it. And, and it's disingenuous for us to pretend that race isn't embedded in the way we construct our politics as a nation. It was in the Constitution. We decided from our inception to treat th humans as three-fifths people, 
so we wrote it down. Sometimes it's referred to as an original sin, but it's also core to how we think about ourselves. So this notion that identity politics is new is completely untrue. It's newly weaponized in the 21st century because those whose identities have been sublimated for the last 400 years finally have enough amassed power to do something about it. And that's what we're seeing. And what I would say is, if you, if you acknowledge the existence of the KKK, if you acknowledge the existence of neo-Nazism, then we've been talking about identity politics for decades. What has happened is that in recent years, the demographic changes in America have allowed coalitions to build that have not previously been able to actually turn their grievances into actual politics. But that's what robust and mature societies do. Those who are the most aggrieved tend to then coalition and take over politics. And then they get what they want for a while. And what's happened is that those coalitions are more diverse, more fractured, but also more effective because they're coupled with social media. You can be on Twitter and tell, I mean, you can create a whole universe of trouble with three tweets and a good bot. You can take a picture on Instagram and tell a story that becomes indelible. You know, Facebook, you can tape injustice and re repeat it endlessly. My point is that we have to stop allowing identity be, to be weaponized against us. We have to acknowledge that they exist. We have to harness it. And then we have to turn it into electoral power because the last vestige of real power for a community is when you can turn all of your issues and all of your actions and all of your energy into electing people who represent you. And the fact is that it's been working, which is why you're now hearing identity politics thrown about by Tucker Carlson as though it's some, some new manifestation of evil. No, it just proves you know, Virginia worked. It proves that we can win elections. It proves that transformation is possible in our politics. And I think we need to embrace it and run with it. I'll say as a reporter who covers the White House, I, I, I've always said that no matter what beat you put me on, I'll write about race because race is the story of America. Um, so I think that there is definitely some, it's, it, it's, it is hard to, to ignore the, the role of race um, in every sector of our society. That said, um, do you think President Trump is a racist? Yes. I think he's racist, I think he's xenophobic, I think he's homophobic, I think he has disdain for anything that he considers different from, than the norm, and he considers himself to be normative, so anything that differs from him is either diminished by comparison or completely, you know, un I think he does not respect people, and I think that disrespect plays itself out on a national stage, on an international stage, and in the way he treats the job that he has been elected to hold. With that said, um, <laughs> you, you pointed out that, I am a bit. Blunt, I figured so. right. <laughs> Just going to give that a moment. Um, <laughs> let's talk about white voters. Um, I interviewed a man in Pennsylvania. This was ahead of the 2016 election, who said he voted. He was a, he was from a Republican household. He voted for President Trump. He voted for Obama first lost his job in a factory, then decided to vote for President Trump. But he doesn't like his style. He thinks he's too brash. Um, sh how do you think Democrats should go after a voter like that? And how should Democrats improve their numbers, specifically with white voters? So I improved Democratic numbers with white voters. So I speak from a position of empiricism. People care about their lives. They don't care about your party. They care about whether or not you see them. Do you value them? Are you willing to invest in them? And part of that means being able to articulate the pain that they feel. Now, if that pain is grounded in a racial animus, you can't fix that. Uh, and the, the problem we've had in our politics f f since time immemorial is a tendency to blame the other for conditions that are hard to fix. Because often in politics, you can either say, here's the solution that's going to cause pain in the process of, of solving it, or you can say, it's that guy's fault, be mad at them, and let me give you pablum about what I'm gonna do. And that buys you four more years of inactivity. My belief is that it doesn't matter what your race is when it comes to what you need. People need economic security, they need educational opportunity for their children. They need to know that 
law enforcement is, is strong and can defend them, but also can respect them and protect their lives. They need to believe that if they pay for something, they get the value for what they've bought. Those are all very real things that cut across racial divisions. I ran in the most, one of the most diverse states in the nation, but I had the same conversation whether I was in North Georgia, which is predominantly white, predominantly rural, in Atlanta or down in Albany, which is predominantly black and fair in, in, in the South. What didn't change was what I talked about. What changed was how I talked about it so that people knew I understood their lives. So when I'm talking to farmers, I can have a conversation about trade from their perspective, but I can also talk about why Medicaid expansion is necessary because they don't have hospitals, because they've lost 10 of them in, in our state because the Republican leadership has refused to expand Medicaid. I can have a conversation about entrepreneurship, but talk about it in inner city where they can't find jobs and also can't get capital to start their businesses. But the same problem is happening in the Northwest Georgia mountains because there are no banks there. So we have to be able to have the same conversation but recognize that there are specific iterations of those conversations for each community, but you don't have to pretend to blame immigrants in order to convince you know, mine workers that their lot in life is hard and that you've got a solution for them. Mm -hmm. In the book, there's places where you can kind of fill out leadership style issues, questions about your ambition, about being courageous. The thesis in the book, and tell me if I'm wrong, is really to be as courageous and ambitious as you want to be and not to limit yourself in your own head. You talk about that. Um, and the idea, don't set limits for yourself. Is that fair? It is, but you make it sound way too easy, so. <laughs> that is very true. I, I need people to read the whole book to get all that. So. <laughs> but yes, that is. You a, should read the whole book, but that, I felt like that was that the, a fair the thesis. Um, <laughs> In that vein about kind of how ambitious can you be, there's a debate going on in the Democratic Party about how progressive the party should be. And I wanna tick through some issues that the Democratic Party is wrestling with. Um, and you can talk to me a little bit about how you think about them and how they fit into the, the leadership style that maybe you think is important. Um, the first is the issue of reparations. There are people like um, Senator Warren, Senator Harris who have come out for that, what, do you, what, what are your thoughts on reparations? I believe reparations are an important conversation. I do not think we know what to do. Uh, when the first conversation about reparations began, we, we were a much smaller nation. And in the immediate aftermath of Reconstruction, and then in the immediate, after, or the immediate inception of Jim Crow, you had a very confined population. We are a deeply diverse country, and that means diversity even within those who are the descendants of slaves but also those who were affected by Jim Crow. And that's separate from the conversation about what happened to Native Americans who weren't given US citizenship until 1924. Uh, we have real conversations we need to hold about the systemic denial of rights in the United States to two specific populations. And these are the two populations who by law could not own property, could not access opportunity, were not only segregate it from it, but isolate it from it. And that creates a generational concern. And so I do think that there is a legitimate conversation to be had about monetary rep reparations, but also uh, systemic reparations that really look at the infrastructure of how our country works. And this is not a new conversation. We've done it before. It's been done on smaller scales, but we have to also recall that a number of the programs that the United States intentionally put in place to advance our causes were denied to, especially African Americans, by way of actually making it happen. The New Deal intentionally did not include black people in order to get Southerners to vote for it. That meant that a number of the pieces that moved the ball forward for so many, black people were told, you're not only not going to get to participate, but we're going to create barriers that continue to this day. They're embedded in how we think about things, how things were built. And so I do think it's a legitimate conversation. What I would say is that no one knows exactly what, okay, I don't think I know exactly what the answer is. And I think we should have that conversation because until we confront that, we will continue to grapple with this issue. Okay. Uh, Medicare for all and government run healthcare. There are some who are pushing for a single payer health care system. What are your thoughts? I believe we should have universal health care. People should be able to access health care. I believe that if you have private providers and you want to keep them, you should be able to remain with a private provider system. But I think the issue is not one of universality in the sense of who gives healthcare, but universality in the fact that no one should be denied healthcare. 
but not government-run healthcare. No, I think government-run healthcare can be part of it, but okay. I think it's disingenuous for us to ignore that we have a robust system of private payer, but also private provider, and we're a very picky nation. We like what we've got. Uh, my point is everyone should have access, and therefore government-run healthcare is, I think, the only way to make certain that everyone is allowed into the system and has access to healthcare. Okay. Uh, Green New Deal. I think it's an important conversation. I think there are pieces. Here, here's the macro. We don't get anywhere when we start limiting ourselves from the moment of inception. If you do not have bold ideas, then you are arguing against the minutia, and that does not lead to progress. We have to have progressive bold ideas, and I think the Green New Deal is, in, is wildly important and the fact that it's going to push conversation and push policy. I think it's going to take time for implementation, and I think there's some things that have to be thought out and tested and means tested, and we have to do a lot of work around it, but I don't think you deny the conversation because you haven't figured out all the answers. This is a topic that you don't deal with in your book as much, but I wanted to ask you about foreign policy, just one question, sure. which is, should there be a counter to President Trump's America First stance and his pulling back of American involvement abroad? He is wrong. We should not be doing this. I, I, I've been involved in foreign policy for more than a decade. I, I serve, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, but before that, I'm an American, and I've traveled. We are part of a global society, and it is dangerous for us to isolate ourselves, and that's what America First does. It says that we are going to abandon our responsibilities, and, and we've got to remember, we were part of creating much of the 20, 20th century and 21st century foreign policy apparatus. We don't now get to take our ball and go home. Uh, but more than that, we are part of a global society, and either we are part of the solution or we are part of the problem. And a notion that we can be isolationist, and more importantly, that we can be arrogant and mean-spirited in it, is deeply problematic because the children in those communities are going to grow up. And part of America's greatness has been the fact that we have been seen as, by and large, a beacon, and a, a beacon. We cannot be seen as a harbinger. After, so in your book, you talk about Chad. <laughs> Chad is her yes. ex-boyfriend. Um, <laughs> not the one who's in the book. Uh, not the one in the romance novel. This is another one. It's a different, yes. it's a different man. Um, after your breakup with him, yes. Chad, you clearly missed out. Um, you started a vision board of sorts. <laughs> um, you have a spreadsheet where you want to achieve different things. You said you have four categories, year, age, job, and task. So let's play a quick game. I'm gonna give you a year, <laughs> and you give me what the job and task I am really be. old, so okay, go ahead. 2020. You think you're clever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I see you, Mish. Okay. In 2020, I will be 46. Thank you. Nobody's ever been excited about 46 before. <laughs> Um, so it will be the year 2020, I will be 46. The job I want will be one that pays. <laughs> Eventually, or now. Is it uh, government paid? I don't know. I, but the task is this, the task, my task, no matter what my job is, my task is to make certain that a Democrat is elected, not only to the White House, but that we have a Democratic majority in the Senate and a Democratic majority in Congress. <laughs> In 2024, will there be a president or vice president or senate? So what you need to know about my spreadsheet is that it actually has an algorithm in it. And I it, love that there's a spreadsheet with an algorithm. It is. Right? And so it adjusts it every year based on the outcomes of certain elections. So oh. if a Democrat wins, you don't ever want to run against someone in your party if they're doing the right thing. And so I have to, each election cycle adjusts based on the previous election cycle. And in your book you so say So hopefully that nothing in 2024. Okay. And you said in your book, if you don't run for president yet, 2028 will be your year. That's actually in the yes. book. That is the, the year in the spreadsheet is 2028. That you would run for president. Yes. That allowed. <laughs> so in the spreadsheet, I allowed for me not winning certain elections. And so putting in, not in the way it happened, but <laughs> that I did not foresee at all. Uh, but I did anticipate that there are things you want that you're not going to get, so you have to create different iterations. And so when I timed it out, 
I think you also have to want the jobs you have. And so I always wanted to run for a job where I was going to do that job. I don't think you use jobs as stepping stones. I think you use them as uh, opportunities to learn, but more importantly, opportunities to serve. And so in the spreadsheet, with all the jobs that I wanted to do, 2028 would be the earliest I would be ready to stand for president because I would have done the work that I thought necessary to be effective in that job. And you're, you sound very intentional. I'm yes. sure people, everyone in this room feels that, but when you read the book, you, you get how intentional you are. Um, and as you're looking at kind of your own intentionality, I'm looking at 2010 can candidates, especially the Democratic field, and I'm saying, okay, all these people support similar issues. What do you think is gonna make the difference for you personally as a voter um, between the Democratic candidates? Is it gonna be receipts, as millennials say, which of course is their past ideas, <laughs> um, or is it gonna be something else? I think it has to be a combination. One, for me, if you do not talk about voter suppression, you do not plan for Democrats to win. And as someone who served in the state legislature, I understand that we can't just win the top of the ticket. We have to win every election from top to bottom because most of the laws that are causing either good or harm actually happen at the local and state level. So I need to know that you understand that the apparatus of democracy is broken in America and you're willing to fight for it. Number two, I need to know that you have the temperament to not get pulled into the lowest common denominator of debate. Uh, if you respond you know, tit for tat, I can't trust that you would be willing to withstand the hardship of doing this work uh, because that kind of petty behavior plays out in multiple ways. Uh, number three, you have to have a vision for what our country can look like. And in my mind, it means having bold, ambitious ideas, even if you know they may not come to full fruition. Because sometimes the goal isn't success, the goal is ambition. You should want more. You should be willing to work for more. And part of leadership is that you then have to work to convince others that what you want is possible. Those are going to be the rubrics I look to. Um, and it won't hurt if the person is a person of color or a woman. <laughs> but it's not exclusive, but those are, those are two things I think are important because we are, as a society, we have, we have to keep moving the ball forward and that means expanding what leadership looks like. Okay. Um, you grew up one of six children in Gulfport, Mississippi. Yes. Um, your younger brother, Walter. Nobody clap for Gulfport, I'm very sad. <laughs> um, your younger brother, Walter, is currently in prison? Or he is uh, recently released again. Re recently released from prison. Um, you say because he made bad choices in, in, to support his drug habit. I personally know a lot of African-American women who are successful and whose brothers struggle to make ends meet or have multiple engagements or, or, or multiple um, interactions with the criminal justice system. Do you think there needs to be a plan or a program specifically tar targeting black men? And, or do you think such programs neglect black women in the process? I think we often create the zero sum analysis that is wrong. Walter, like so many young men had, he has a mental health disorder, he's bipolar. Um, and and the, the challenge then is that it manifests itself in different ways in boys. If you're a black boy who is already rambunctious and gregarious, you're treated as a miniature criminal when you're younger and then that behavior continues to be reinforced, you aren't given treatment, you aren't given access, you aren't seen as someone who is in need of support, you are seen as someone to be afraid of. And so we have to have a very specific way of talking about and serving young black men and our young black boys and young black men uh, because we create a pipeline that is not, a, it's, it's not false. It is a true pipeline from school to prison. Uh, because of how often we underserve, and more importantly, how often we criminalize normal childhood behavior. Separately for black women, black girls are hypersexualized, they are often diminished, they are treated differently, they are denied access to opportunity, they are treated as adults long before they've reached adulthood, and therefore their sense of responsibility and obligation is often heightened. And then you couple that with the normative standard in our society where you tend to have relationships within your race, you then create this dynamic of black girls taking care of black boys, where both are in need of help themselves. The manifestation of those problems play out differently in our communities, but they're very real. And so I don't think it's pitting black girls against black boys, it's recognizing that we have a responsibility to not waste the human capital that's embedded in the black community and that 
unfortunately our public school system and all the intended responsibilities do not see and do not treasure. You've written eight books featuring adventurous black women under the pen name Selena Montgomery. Um, you write in your book that's coming out um, that affairs of the heart perplex you. Yes. Is that still true? And if so, why? And tell me more. <laughs> I have not been good at dating. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Chad broke up with me and I wrote my manifesto. Um, <laughs> broke up with Derek and I wrote a romance novel. <laughs> Um, they're very good for my ambitions, they're not good, uh, but I've not been good at, at, at building those kind of long-standing relationships, and in part because after a couple of, I'm also very goal-oriented, and if I think I'm not good at something, I will practice it and see if I can get better, or I just say never mind. Um, this was one of the never minds, I also dropped out of, I stopped being a physicist because I didn't like differential calculus, so it, it cuts across. <laughs> um, but I think I write really, well about how love can work. I've not been able to put it into practice in part because once I stopped being actively engaged in dating, I, you know, this is one of those skills you have to practice in real life, and I have not. And apparently they aren't, you know, men aren't gonna just come to your door and knock on your door. I mean, it may have happened with you, but with me. My mother pushed me out the door. See, there you go. Um, <laughs> And because of what I've been focused on, I just have not done a, a good intentional job. And, and you, were, you were correct, I am very intentional. And I've not made dating an intention. I wish I had, and I think I still can. And so my responsibility is to think through how can I be more intentional about dating. I will tell you, because it feels like I'm talking to Oprah. Um, <laughs> I thought about using a dating service. Uh, and when I talked to two of them, they both said that they could not take me on as a client until I lost weight. Oh, no, and, and here's why I put this out there. Part of how we are judged, part of our successes are often driven by how we are perceived, but also what our access is. And I'm a very confident person. I, I believe in my capacity for many things. But when you hit a moment of frailty, having someone reinforce that, that frailty and tell you they won't take your money, <laughs> it makes it hard to incentivize yourself to try. Uh, and so part of my responsibility is to move beyond even that diminution of my capacity and think about what else do I need to do. And I should tell you, things like that really stick. As someone they who's do. on TV, I've been told, hey, you're, we don't do plus size women. You need to not show your arms because nobody wants to see exactly. your arms. It's, it's a very hurtful it thing is. to say. Um, but as someone who I think, I, I think people in this room would agree, people would be a catch. You would be a catch. I think so too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think, I think this live stream could work. There you go. I think this live stream could work. Um, Hi, my name is Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you for sharing that. That was very touching. Um, so I want to go to the, your questions in the audience. Um, there are several here. Um, let's see here, which one I want to do. I'm going to go with, um, how do you feel about HR, which is the legislation condemning Rep. Omar's controversy with, about her McCain tweets? Are Dems playing into the identity politics narrative of the right? I will tell you, I do not know what the McCain tweets are. Uh, the McCain tweets were, from my understanding, wait, McCain tweets? That's the thing. I think, I think that they're talking about the tweets about her, about uh, dealing with um, Jewish gotcha. lobbyists okay. and, and the, the, the bill that was passed gotcha. condemning anti-Semitism. That, that cool. I think that's what they, that's okay. what they mean. I, I think that, first and foremost, I think the Democratic Party did the right thing, which is we have to acknowledge that there are multiple forms of hate that are pervasive in our politics, and we diminish the capacity of pushback when we only pick one form of hate to call out. I do not believe that Ilhan Omar intended to be anti-Semitic, uh, but Chris Hayes actually said something in a tweet that I think is really true, which is what's happening is that she's using illusory, or uh, she's alluding to behaviors using tropes that may in her mind not be anti-Semitic, but certainly are because of their historical context. But what she should do is just call out the behavior she doesn't like, uh, actually name it. So instead of alluding to this sort of vast 
conspiracy say that you do not like this behavior that is pushed by this organization and call it out and call it what it is. Because until you do so, then you are creating a space where it appears to be that you are treating every member of the Jewish community as the same. And I don't think that's her intention. I think that she is concerned about what she is seeing, that she has a unique perspective in our Congress, and that her perspective should be given airing as long as it is not uh, hateful and intended to harm communities. Uh, and so I think in response, you know, it, it was a clumsy response in some ways. I think the Democratic Party did what it could to say, we acknowledge the legitimate hurt that that language brings to those who understand how insidious and rampant anti-Semitism is, but we are also not going to give short shrift to the Islamophobia that has that we saw manifested in the West Virginia legislature where they put a picture of this congresswoman and accused her of having some role to play in 9-11. Uh, and that you know, we have racism that goes unchecked by the very people who are condemning her for her behavior. And so you know, I think it did the best job it could in a complicated world with a complicated conversation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the next question, um, what is your advice for people who don't work in politics or public service, but are passionate and want to help? What can we do to be the most impactful? I'm glad you ask. Uh, if you go to Lead from the Outside, available in your bookstores March 26. Uh, so Lead from the Outside is not a political book. I, I like to say I'm a reality show waiting to happen. I'm a romance novelist, tax attorney, politician, civic leader, and a serial entrepreneur. And so the whole point of the book is to talk about the ways we harness what is best for us. Not everyone wants to be in politics and everyone should be in politics, but all of us can make an impact and can make change where we are. And so the first responsibility is to figure out what ignites you. What is it that wakes you up, you get excited about? If it's animals, if it's criminal justice, if it's climate change, figure out the issue that animates you, the thing that you think about because if you can think about it and then put it aside, that's not it. It's gotta be the thing that makes you angry or upset or you know, it's the thing you all, it's the, it's the filter that you use to figure out what you're gonna pay attention to. That's the place where you need to start. The second job then is to find out who's doing the best job possible. Don't go there. Go to the place doing the second best job because they could use your help. The people doing good don't really need you. The people who are trying, they're gonna let you do stuff. And part of leadership is not coming in just to be one of the people, it's coming in and trying to be one of the best. And so find the place that's doing a second, you know, number two, number three, don't go to number zero because th that's probably just a cesspool. But <laughs> find somewhere in the middle and then think about what you do best. If you don't like talking to people, do not get on the phones. And if you like talking to people, do not go into the back office. Make sure you've matched your skills with your intent but like anything, do something that excites you, do it for someone who needs you, and do the thing that you're good at doing and make it better. Um, the next question is beyond combating voter suppression, what do, you think, what do you think are ways to encourage greater turnout, especially for young generations? You have to talk to people. So in politics, we have this phrase, there are these two terms of art. One's persuasion and the other is turnout. Persuasion says we're going to go to you and we're going to talk to you about our values and we're going to try to convince you that you share our values and we're going to spend a lot of money. Turnout says you already agree with us. We'll come to you the last six weeks of an election and remind you to do something about it. The problem is a lot of people we consider turnout targets because they share our values are persuasion targets because they don't think they need to do anything about it. If you are a young person, if you're a marginalized community, you've seen politicians come and go and your life does not get better. Therefore, you need to be persuaded that the whole system matters. And we have to treat every single community group as a persuasion target. What we did differently in our campaign is that we worked, we did not have turnout. I did not think black people were gonna vote for me because I'm black. And that's a whole lot of people. I had to spend as much time talking to the black community, talking to black women, as I did talking to white single moms, as I did talking to white suburban moms, Latino farmers. We went everywhere and talked to everyone. It's expensive, and that's why politicians don't do it. They do not invest because they think that it's easier to just, that it's inefficient to try to talk to everyone. 
What's inefficient is losing. <laughs> and so I would prefer that people treat every single voter as a persuasion target. Now here's the difference. I do not believe in trying to persuade someone to change their ideology. You're not gonna convince me that reproductive choice is wrong. You're not gonna convince me that poverty is a good. And so don't try to attack my ideology. If I believe that to be true, why would I think the inverse is also not true? And so I do not spend time trying to convince someone who has hardcore conservative beliefs that are antithetical to my own that they need to change their minds. My job is to either tell them, here's what I'm gonna do to make both our lives better and come with me if you want, but I'm gonna spend more time on people who already share my values, but who have never seen a politician come to their community and have never heard a policy idea that actually addresses their issues. Um. One thing that you said that, just as a reporter, I tell people all the time, this idea of black people just voting for people because they were black, I say if that was the case, Herman Cain would have done better, exactly. correct? Um, and we all know how that ended. Um, so the next question is, how can we create and tell better stories about voter suppression so we can start solving this problem? So part of what we are doing through Fair Fight Action is we are actually collecting stories. We collected more than 200 stories. But mind you, 50,000 people called our voter suppression hotline between election day and the non-concession day, the day I did my non-concession speech. In that 10-day period, if 50,000 people called, that means 50,000 people didn't know they could call, and another 50,000 people thought it was their fault. And so part of the responsibility is collecting the stories and creating space for people to talk about what happened. And then the second piece is that we have to talk about voter suppression all the time. The conservatives talk about voter fraud so much that we believe it's true, even though they have not a single shred of evidence. We know voter suppression is real because most of us have faced it. If we didn't face it, we know someone who has. And we don't talk about it at all because we assume it's a personal problem, that somebody was being irresponsible. Voter suppression works because it's insidious, because it looks like it's supposed to happen. We have to talk about it all the time. We have to amplify it on every platform, and we have to demand that our leaders do something about it. You should not vote for a presidential candidate who cannot tell you how they will fight voter suppression. Mm -hmm. um, Y'all should clap for that, that was really good. See, Stacy also gives directions if you need to. Thank you. <laughs> um, there are audience questions, but I wanna ask And you just be clear, that was not a George, a Jeb Bush please clap moment, okay? That was <laughs> we have a couple minutes left. I actually wanna go back to some of my questions. Um, you said something that I think really touched probably a lot of people. You talked about weight, you talked about your race, you talked about dating. Something that I do when I met, I meditate a lot, because um, we're feeling like Oprah right now. And <laughs> I ask myself, what advice would I give someone else with the same issues that I have? So for people that are watching this and say, man, Stacy just said that and that just touched me, what would you say to someone else who, who, who maybe has been told that, who's been told you're too big or your hair's not right or you're never gonna get a man because you just don't look like the girl on TV? What would you tell that girl? So number one, I, not in the dating space but in the electoral politics space, I was told I had to change my hair, my weight, that I was too dark, that I needed to dress differently, I mean, basically, there was, no, oh, my teeth, I had to fix my teeth. I mean, there was nothing about me they liked. I think my eyes were okay, but I'm, I probably didn't pay enough attention to the Twitter feed. Um, and what I decided when I ran for office was that I was not going to change who I was because that's what's made me who I am. Mm. My response... And while I want to be healthier, if I lose weight, it's gonna be because I'm trying to be healthier, not because I'm trying to fit some, there's no amount of weight I'm going to lose that is going to reduce some parts of my body. Um, they are what they are. <laughs> and I'm pretty good with them. And so for me, I'm not focusing on weight loss, I'm focusing on my health because I do have a lot more to do. And I'm currently healthy, but I wanna stay that way. And so I'm gonna continue, because when you hit 45, 46, stuff starts breaking that you didn't know you had. I'm like, that's a muscle? Like, what is that? <laughs> and so I'm gonna work on being healthy, but we have, to, we have to love ourselves as we are, and that sounds very, you know, meditative-ish, but, but, but here's what I mean. This is the package I've got. I can do things to it, but the part that I control the most is what I do about it. I'm going to date because I'm going to make it an intention. I'm going to work on it. And I'm not gonna date anyone who sees me as less than. I am smart, I'm vaguely funny, 
and I'm a great conversationalist. And you, whoever you are, have skills and attributes that are solely you, and they are worthy. And so my response is, you know, ignore those who would tell you you are less than, and focus on being the best you that you can be, and read my book to tell you how to do that. <laughs> um, well, I think that that was a great way to end. I think I, I appreciate you being somewhat vulnerable. I appreciate you giving people advice that I think would want to hear it in this room. I know I read your book and was circling things and filling things out, so I, I really appreciate you, Thank you talking with me, and I appreciate all of you on the internet and in this room for submitting your questions. Thank you so much. You. Can I do one more thing? So we are signing my book across at the convention center, uh, I think at 1130. Mm -hmm. And so please wander over there after you've given Yamish Sendor a huge round of applause for being fantastic at her job.